Thanks so much, Brother Andrew. Uh, yeah, pray then this way is the uh, the way it's it's given in the NASB. Um, so I, I did change my topic. I I uh, had some really exciting uh, lessons that I learned about uh, about the Ark of the Covenant, uh, and and my goal has been for a couple of years now to to get more into it, and I uh, I, I can't seem to really sink my teeth into it. But one thing that I have been thinking about a lot uh, lately is prayer. And, and prayer has come up a number of times. Uh, Brother Johnny spoke about it a couple of times. Uh, I've talked specifically about uh, our prayers related to Jesus or specifically to Jesus uh, lately as well. Um, and for today's class, I, I want to focus on maybe the, the content of our prayers. Um, you know, what, what, is, what is in our prayers? What is the focus? Uh, of our prayers. But before I uh, get into uh, the class, I, Emmy and I were reflecting the other day how uh, how much we love the Cambridge Ecclesia. Uh, we're so so thankful for you. Uh, the Cambridge Ecclesia is such a positive ecclesia. There's so much positive work done. Uh, so many positive messages are being shared. Uh, last week's Bible class was really good at Brother Tony. Uh, Mike's exhortation was was wonderful. It's just a just a very positive and, and encouraging um, exhortation. And the the evening session, uh, how to engage our youth, it was was great. Uh, we need to all be engaged, right, in in, in various degrees and various ways. Uh, and there's so many things happening in Cambridge. So many positive things, um, and there is so much different engagement from from different. Uh, age groups and from different families and individuals and, and it really is wonderful and so uh, we just want to express our thanks to you and encourage our ecclesia to to keep this up to to be a strong uh lampstand where we preach the word of god and we encourage it, encourage each other so uh thank you now the Gospels all uh, tell us a story of Jesus, right? The, the Gospel is the good news and the glad tidings uh, of, of the kingdom of God, right? And that is, that is the, the message that Jesus shares. And so those four Gospels focus on the ministry of the Lord Jesus. And I think we all know that those aren't just kind of the four best collections they could find and, and they stuck those together or just for the sake of having a few different points of view. Uh, God has specifically left us with those to teach us specific lessons. And so um, there are similar accounts, uh, obviously, throughout the Gospels, and, and they're all told in slightly uh, different ways. And there's a reason for that. And it would be good for us to always ask questions, well, why, why is it said that way? Why is this left out? Why is there so much focus on this? I mean, half of John's Gospel is... Um, you know, quite half, but the, the last uh, third is focused on the last uh, day, essentially, of Jesus' life, right? Or, sorry, the last week of Jesus' life. So a lot of focus uh, there that the other Gospels don't have. Now, Matthew has uh, three chapters, essentially, dedicated to what we kind of know as a Sermon on the Mount. And there is a specific message, I think, that we're, uh, we're trying, that we should learn from these passages um, that Matthew certainly gives us the most focus from, from all of them. And then right in the middle is uh, the prayer that Jesus teaches. Now, if you, uh, so this account in uh, Matthew five to seven, for instance, comes up in Luke as well, Luke chapter um, six. If you just turn to uh, Luke chapter six. You can see how this is the, the exact same account, yet slightly different. Uh, in So chapter 6, and for instance, in verse 20, um, and this is what Tony talked about last week. Uh, and turning his gaze towards his disciples, he began to say, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Right? And those are the Beatitudes that, uh, that Brother Tony referred to. Uh, if we go down to verse 27, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, which comes up in, in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 31. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you, which is uh, comes up in chapter 7 uh, in Matthew. 
And so uh, as you can go through through this section here, you'll find there it's the exact same account. Yet the prayer is, is told very differently. If you turn to um, Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, you see there that uh, in verse 1, it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. And then he, uh, he, he tells him that prayer. And so it's interesting that Luke places it somewhere totally different, although I, I do think this all happened on that same mountain. And I think there's uh, other things that happen that we don't read in Matthew. But the only reason I'm pointing that out is that it's laid out differently for us to pick up a theme, for us to see what is it that Matthew is trying to teach us by laying it out in this way. Uh, and, and why is that prayer a part of it? Um, so Matthew 5 to 7 uh, gives an account of Jesus essentially being followed by a crowd. They're, they're following him everywhere. Uh, and uh, he is teaching them and teaching his disciples. And so. Um, the, obviously, the well, there is a lesson here that uh, that ties into uh, to those people. The contrast that Matthew seems to make here is the difference between now and then. So uh, now and the future, now and the kingdom, essentially now and, and when uh, Jesus will return to this earth, the kingdom of heaven. And. In chapter four that we, uh, we didn't read, but at the end of chapter four, we see kind of the, what sets the scene here, right? How, uh, how Jesus finds himself in that mountain where he is teaching from. And so uh, Matthew chapter four and verse 23, Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom to so the good news of the kingdom of God and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. Notice the focus there, right? So it was healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. Verse 24, the news about him spread throughout all Syria and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, it's at least the way the NASB reads it, paralytics, and he healed them. And large crowds followed him from Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and beyond the Jordan. So people are following him everywhere, bringing anyone who had any kind of ailment in any different way. Right? There's a lot of focus on the, the healing and people bring to him anyone with any disease or any kind of uh, pain or anything. And, and, and he healed them. And so I think the contrast that Jesus is, is, is laying here, I said, you know what, I'm, you're just focusing on the healing. You're focusing on me resolving your immediate problem, which will make you happy, but it's only temporary. Right? This, isn't, this isn't a blessing. This isn't, I'm healing you because it's what I'm imagining Jesus saying. I'm healing, he's healing them because he feels compassion for them. But that's not, there, that's not all to life. There's much more to life, I think, is what Jesus is trying to, uh, trying to say here. And so then he contrasts them uh, to the reason why they come to him and, and what really matters in life. And so Jesus, uh, in chapter 5 and verse 1, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain. And I'll suggest to you that he stayed there for the night. And after he sat down, uh, so this is afterwards, he, he came down and sat down and his disciples came to him. And this is where he, uh, I think it's at that point where he um, chose his disciples. He selected his disciples after spending that night in prayer. Then he opened his mouth and began to teach them. And so what he tells them there is uh, that what we know as the beatitude, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Right? So it's, a, it's looking forward to the future. Blessed are those who mourn. You're actually blessed if you mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. It's all future uh, looking. This shall happen to you. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. 
Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, right? And so he is saying here that blessed are those who do have that suffering, who do have that, those trials in their lives, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And the focus here in verse 12, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way, they uh, persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so Jesus is beginning to lay this contrast. They're focused on the healing. And Jesus saying, what will actually make you happy is if you not focus on this life, on solving this world's problems, but focusing on what is after this life. And so as uh, an exercise of engagement, uh, I will ask you to, to unmute yourself and uh, you don't have to turn on your camera if you don't want to, but um, what other contrasts are there in, in this um, in this section, chapters five, six, and seven? So I'm looking for contrasts essentially between now and then, between uh, something that we have now or can have now in this world and something that we can have in the future uh, as a contrast. So feel free to, um, my camera's on the left, that's why I'm looking the left. Uh, but feel free to unmute yourself, and uh, and there's a lot of contrast here between um, what we have now and what we can have in the future. I'm just seeing if anyone is unmuting themselves. So I'm looking for a contrast. And you read a few in chapter six. There's a bunch in chapter five, and there's some more in chapter seven as well. So contrast of something that we have now that we can have now and something that we can have in the future. And this is going to be a long evening if I don't hear from you. Brother Brian? Well, in chapter 6, verse 24, no man can serve two masters, for either you hate one and love the other, or else you hold one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and man. Is that mm -hmm. the contrast you're looking for? That certainly is a contrast. And so um, it's. I think it's understood that, I mean, wealth is something of this world, uh, which you can't take with you. Um, but what, yeah, so what I'm more so, I guess, looking for was a contrast for things in this world. And so what we read, for instance, was um, in chapter six, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by men. Otherwise, you have no reward with your father who is in heaven. So on the one hand, you have that reward now if you practice your righteousness before men. And on the other side, you have a reward with your father who is in heaven, which is, of course, a, a future reward. I can point out a few more if uh, um, if there's no, uh, if you can't think of any um, off the top of your head, but thank you for, for suggesting that one. Um, so for instance, we can look at uh, chapter, sorry, verse 27, uh, right? You shall hurt that it is said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you, for it is better that you, uh, for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell, right? And so um, it is better for you to go without things in this life so that in a uh, future life, sorry, in, uh, in the future, you can inherit uh, the kingdom as opposed to staying in the grave. Uh, for instance, in verse 39, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other also to him. Uh, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give him also uh, who asks of you, 
and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. And ultimately, uh, the, the contrast there is that in verse uh, well, 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. And so the contrast there is that uh, if we're sons of our father who's in heaven, we'll again inherit uh, the kingdom of God, um, as opposed to having all those things in our life now. I mean, that, that makes our life now uh, more difficult, more painful. I mean, being slapped, uh, people suing you and, and giving them more, uh, they force you to go one mile, go within two miles, right? You're, you're giving up many things now. Uh, you're giving up comfort now to have those things in the future. And again, uh, that whole section that we read uh, at the beginning of the, the Beatitudes, right? Bless are the, those who mourn, right? If you're mourning now, the, um, the contrast is that in, uh, in the future, you will inherit the kingdom of God and you will be comforted. Uh, there's a few more uh, as, as we go throughout chapters five, six, and seven, um, right? I mean, the, the whole focus of the last part of uh, chapter six is don't worry about, about things now. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about uh, what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, right? Focus on, uh, on what is ahead <clears throat> and then all things will be added unto you. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a number more, but we don't have to uh, uh, focus on too much. But what I basically wanted to show is that uh, Jesus is trying to teach them that uh, it's not necessarily about the here and now. It's about um, what we'll get in the future. And the whole section in chapter six um, from verses one to um, seven, you know, it's all about having a reward now, you know, uh, if you're if you're praying and if you're giving, you'll make it very obvious that you're giving. You'll have your reward now, uh, but if you give in secret, you'll have your reward with your Father who's in heaven. Um, see verse sixteen: When you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. Right. So the contrast there again is that. You either have a comfortable life now, you have your reward now, you have the glory and honor now, or you will have those things in, um, in the future in the kingdom of God. And so there's a big focus here on the reward in the future. That prayer is kind of tucked in here among all of that, uh, among all of Jesus' teaching here. And it's very practical uh, teachings. And so Jesus says there, uh, you know, when you pray, pray in this way. And, and you'll see that it's very future thinking. Everything about this is, is very uh, future thinking, contrasting it to the here and now. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Right? And we know that, that the, uh, the name of the Lord uh, will be glorified in the future. Um, and... Um, the knowledge of the name of God will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. Your kingdom come, right? God's kingdom will come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is a, a future thing that will happen. Now, the contrast here in this prayer, give us this day our daily bread, right? So give us what we need for this day. And forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Because in the end of the day, the only thing that really matters is that we have enough to survive for this day, just to get by. But at the end of our life, whether you're young or old, at the end of your life, the only thing that matters is having your sins forgiven. That is the only thing that matters when you leave this world, when you die. That's the only thing that matters, right? It's God's forgiveness because it's only with God's forgiveness that we can inherit the kingdom of God. Don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, right? We, we don't want to be distracted from, uh, from that goal, that future goal. So lead us away from temptation to focus on the here and now, to focus on receiving our glory now, to focus on, on having a, a comfortable life without persecution, without mourning, right? And people, that's why they brought their sick 
to Jesus because it, they didn't want to be sad. They didn't want the, to suffer. They didn't want all of these things. And so they came to Jesus to be healed. And Jesus quickly noticed um, that they needed to be taught that it's not about this life. It's not about even ease and, and comfort in this life. It is about uh, the future. There will be a time where you will be blessed uh, eternally. And so throughout his uh, gospel, uh, throughout Matthew's gospel, God has shown us the importance of, of not getting caught up in the temporary things. And prayer, uh, like I said, plays a big uh, role in that. And so for tonight's Bible class, I want to look at two examples, uh, one where this goes well and one where this goes not so well. And where it's specifically the focus of prayers related to um, even our day-to-day -day life and also our, our outlook on the future. So where this doesn't go so well is in James. And we're going to spend a little bit of time in James. Um, so if you want like to turn there and follow along. I know I've mentioned this before, but James is really um, a commentary, or one way to look at James, I should say, is as a commentary on Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Uh, I know it's going to be a little bit still before we look at James in our daily readings, it'll be a few months. Um, but next time you look at uh, James, maybe you've done this already, but see how many connections you can find to Matthew 5, 6, and 7. There are a lot of connections. I think this is a, a commentary on uh, those teachings of Jesus, uh, and, or maybe James is expanding on this, making what was already very practical teaching even more practical to see how we can apply this into our day-to-day -day lives. But that is not our focus of this evening. Uh, I specifically want to focus on chapter 4, this ecclesia had, uh, had some issues, they had some struggles for sure. Uh, one of them was uh, the difference between the very rich and the very poor. Um, and preference was actually given to the rich in this ecclesia, which we know is a problem. And the rich, in fact, oppress the poor, which is, of course, a big problem. Now, let's read uh, chapter four in the first four verses there. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts? And that's very politely stated by the NASB. Uh, I think what the, the original Greek has a sense of fights and wars, <clears throat> which I believe um, King James and, and New King James would have. So what is the source of, of fights and wars among you? Is it not the source is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have. So you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. So um, it's a, James establishes here that there are fights and wars among them. And, and of course, that figuratively, uh, there's not actually generals here uh, assessing how they can best destroy each other and, and uh, um, you know, how to, how to fight a battle. But nonetheless, I think he is using those terms because uh, what they were doing, their, their fighting uh, had deadly spiritual consequences for their ecclesia. It looks like there was a uh, bitter infighting in this ecclesia, fueled apparently by envy and jealousy. And the source of all that was uh, their own desire for pleasure and lust. Now, sorry, I should say pleasure or lust, because depending on, again, which translation you have, it, it may be in verse one, um, the source of your uh, is not the source, your pleasures. It could also be translated as lust. But that word pleasure or lust is not the usual word that's used for lust. I mean, we, we read in uh, Matthew, we didn't read, but it is in Matthew 5. If you lustfully look at someone, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Um, a few, uh, well, two books further, I suppose, uh, two or three. And uh, in, in John, it talks about um, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. Um, that's not the same word. And so I think there's two types of lust. There is the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. 
where you lustfully look at something. This is what, what David did, right? David saw Bathsheba and, and lusted after her. Uh, Judah did the same thing. He saw this Canaanite woman and he lusted after her. Um, I think that's not the, the word that's used here. So it still means to, to, to have pleasure or to, to want something, to desire something. Um, but it's used in a different way. And, and we'll look up a couple of places where this is used. It's used five times. Um, let's go to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. And this is the parable of the sower. And we read there in verse 14. So this is just the very end of the, the parable of the sower. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no maturity, uh, sorry, bring no fruit to maturity. And, and, and so I think it's grouped in there with a few different words, worries, riches, and pleasures of this life. So it's more focused on, on the, you know, the worries and riches of, of, this life and and uh, and the comfort and the ease not so much the uh like the the physical lusting like seeing something ah i want that thing that i'm looking at right that's that's not a thing that this is talking about it's just the the you know the worries and riches and, and pleasures and comforts uh of of this world um it's used and this comes out maybe a little bit clearer in some of the other passages, but if you go to Titus, Titus chapter 3, of course, just before Philemon, which is just before Hebrews, Titus chapter 3. For some reason, I always had a hard time finding Titus when I was young. So Titus chapter 3, when I say when I was younger, I mean like last year. Uh, Titus chapter 3 and verse 3. He says, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, right? And so I think it's shown here that those are two different things. We're enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, uh, hateful, hating one another. And so uh, if we turn to James again. It's mentioned in uh, Second Peter, I think, as well. And those are the only places that that word is mentioned. But if you go, if you read the context here, um, you'll see that it, it doesn't actually make sense to look at this in the way of um, of lusting after, you know, with your, you, you see it with your eyes and you just want it. You can't stop thinking about it. You want whatever it is that you just saw. And... You see this in verse three, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. If that was the word lust, that wouldn't make any sense. Like nobody is going to pray to God to give you something that you lust after that you know is wrong. Right? No one is going to say, God, please give me more money because I want to party. I, God, please give me more money. I need a speedboat. Right? That's that's not. It doesn't make sense. And and this is not how how they would pray. They wouldn't say, you know, I I want to uh, I want to give in to the lusts that I have, and therefore I want a fancy car because I know girls like fancy cars. And so it doesn't make sense. What does make sense here is if you look at the context of this ecclesia. This ecclesia, uh, the letter, well, sorry, this isn't written to one ecclesia. Uh, this letter was written to, uh, most likely to the Jews who are persecuted. If you go to uh, chapter one and verse one, to the 12 tribes, this is clearly speaking to Jews, to the 12 tribes, tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings, considered all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. And so we have a group of people who are scattered throughout the whole uh, you know, known world, the Roman Empire, they're scattered through the earth, they are suffering, they have trials, uh, they have been persecuted, right? Life is difficult for them, life is rough. And all they want 
is for those things just to be taken away. And they see that there are some in there who are rich and who, who, uh, who are wealthy. And, you know, those are the ones who are given preference and, and the rich are actually even, uh, you know, oppressing the, the poor and dragging them into courts as is shown in, in chapter two. And so all they want is just the, the normal good things of this life to just be able to lead a, uh, a happy life free of persecution, free of problems, free of, of, of just of poverty, right? And, and that makes a lot more sense because you can actually honestly go to God and ask for that. And we do that too. We ask for God for our troubles to be removed. We ask for God for our suffering to be removed. And that is uh, what I think this lusting is speaking after this, this pleasure is for us to just have a comfortable life, to have a reasonable amount of riches, to be able to enjoy my life without constantly being persecuted. And this is what the problem was with the people who came to Jesus, right? All they wanted was just for their immediate problems to be resolved. They knew he could heal. And they went to him to be healed. They just wanted their sick to be healed and their immediate problems to be removed because that would make them happy. And, and it, I want the same. I want that too. I don't like to be sad. I don't like to suffer. I don't want that. And so I will regularly ask for God for those things to be taken away, for those things to be removed. Paul did the same thing. Paul had this thorn in the flesh and he just wanted it to be gone. And he asked God, he asked Jesus for it to be removed. It's normal for us to feel that way. The problem is, is that can start to take over. And that's what Jesus noticed, is that they weren't coming to him for be, to be taught anymore, which they were at some point. I, I don't doubt that. But now the desire for their immediate problems to be resolved has taken over. And we start to love our life, to be friends with our life in this world, as James goes on to say later on. That starts to take over, and our focus is shifting from what is in the future to what is now. You'll see this in, uh, in verse four. You adulteresses, do you know what? Uh, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? And I'll ask you another question. Uh, many transcripts or manuscripts uh, only have the word adulteresses there, the female version uh, i suppose um why do you think that is why the why do you think the focus is on adulteresses why female and not the the male version i i realize that some translations have adulterers and adulteresses uh, but most manuscripts and translations only have adulteresses any thoughts on, on why that could be? Will I take a drink of water? Why would the focus be on adulteresses? Well, the, the King James, uh, as you indicate, is one of those uh, uh, that has got adulterers and adulteresses. And I'd suggest that um, the idea of the dropping adulterous comes from the documents that are, there's two, two lines of documents for the Bible. Mm. And you've got one which gives us the received text, and you've got the one which all of the modern versions come from. And I would say, and that also comes down through the Catholic Church. And I would suggest that the reasoning there is because uh, it would not condemn those that are male in the Catholic Church. That's a point of view that I, uh, I had not considered. Um, so I think you're, so I would have to uh, take your word for that in the English translations that is, uh, that is the case um, for the modern ones. There are uh, other languages where the older translations also omitted. Um, so a Dutch one that I'm familiar with from the 1600s as well uh, also uh, does not have that. But the reason I think that it's uh, specifically focused on adulteresses there is because 
it that way it addresses the ecclesia and it, it indicates that we have this relationship with God where we're espoused to him, right? Where um, our relationship is with us being the bride uh, and Christ being the, the groom, right? And so what we're doing is if we go down to, uh, if we keep reading in verse four, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires a spirit which he had made to dwell in us. Right? And so what God is saying is that uh, if, our, if our desire, our pleasures are for our problems to be removed in this world and to have a comfortable life now, uh, and, and our love becomes of this world, we are essentially going one way where God wants us to go another way. And, and, and he, he calls it hostility towards, uh, towards God. And we become uh, an enemy of God if we make ourselves a friend of the world. And so if, we, uh, if our focus of our prayers is to have the pleasures of this life, uh, and, and I, I truly believe that uh, this is talking about just the comfort of life, the basic uh, kind of necessities, the uh, you know, free of persecution, free of of fear, um, and you know, a, a reasonable, comfortable lifestyle. If that is what we're looking for, if that is what our focus is, and that is what we want, our our view is too temporary, uh, and it's too narrowly focused on on what is now, and we forget about the future. And eventually, us and God are going into two different directions and so then in verse 7 he says submit therefore to god resist the devil and he will flee from you very similar words to um to the lord's prayer where he says lead us away lead us not in temptation but deliver us from the evil one draw near to god and he will draw near to you right? so uh, instead of drawing near to this world draw near to god cleanse your hands you sinners and purify your hearts you double-minded be miserable and mourn and weep. Again, very similar words to uh, Matthew chapter five. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Those are those are very gloomy words, and and that actually does not sound like the kind of life I want. But I don't want my life. I don't want to be miserable. And so. I also don't think that God wants us to be miserable. I don't think God actually wants us to, to just have a complete miserable life, to go around mourning and weeping only, and where there is no laughter in our lives, or where it's just uh, mourning and our joy is just in gloom. I don't think that's what God actually wants. And so what I think he is doing here is saying that, that contrast, that their life is so focused on uh, you know riches, and, and because they see... Uh, others who have things that they don't have and they become jealous. Uh, they are envious, as James says here in the first few verses. And, and uh, I think what James is saying is that it's better for you to be miserable and to, be, uh, to, be, to mourn and to weep rather than what you're doing now. Because what you're doing now is only leading to a love of this world, a loving of your comfortable life without persecution, without... Um, without trials without tribulation i think that is what uh what james is focusing on here instead what james does is he focuses them to endure their trials to endure their trials with patience chapter 5 and verse 7 therefore be patient brethren until the coming of the lord the farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil being impatient about it until it gets the early and latter rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is near, right? The, the, the coming of the Lord is near. And so we're being uh, instructed and encouraged here to focus on that. Focus on it. Be patient. You will endure. The coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. 
This is very interesting. In verse 11, we count those blessed who endured. That is what it means to be blessed, to endure your trials, to hold on to the end, because that is when you receive the blessings. That is when you receive where you inherit eternal life, a life of true happiness, a life of true blessedness. And so for your trials to be taken away is not a blessing. For you to endure your trials is a blessing. If someone is not healed, it doesn't mean that that person is not blessed and vice versa. Uh, just because you're healed, that's not necessarily a blessing from God because it's too temporal. The blessings are the kingdom of, or is the kingdom of heaven and all those things related to it. And those who endure till the end are blessed because they will inherit. Now we're going to very quickly look at the opposite. And I'll uh, share my, my one slide with you. Um, because all these aspects um, that Jesus t t tells us to pray about, and I've talked about this before too, but I just find it very, uh, uh, very helpful and very informative and in insightful about how important uh, the understanding of this prayer is. <clears throat> uh, so if you look in, for back in Matthew 6, I'll just quickly share my screen. So if you compare uh, Matthew 6 to the last day of Jesus' life, right, where he spends uh, time with his disciples, uh, where he's arrested, where he's crucified, all of those things that he mentions where he says, pray then in this way, they also come up in the last day of his life in the form of a prayer. Uh, and we're not going to go through all of them. Um, but our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be your name. That is all over John 17, right? He addresses his father. Uh, he, he mentioned to his father in prayer that he came to manifest the name of God. Uh, we can turn to Luke just to look up a few of these other ones. Uh, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're very familiar with these verses uh, in Luke chapter 22 and verse 42 which is 41 for context, he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Uh, give us this day our daily bread. And if we turn to verse 19, we read this very regularly, uh, verse 19 of uh, chapter 22 still. And when he had taken some bread and had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, uh, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Right? And so there's a focus on, uh, on that bread. Uh, all that he, he needed at that time was to, to give them that bread and that wine for them to, to remember him. Um, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. If you turn to Luke 23. And verse 34, but Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And lastly, do not lead us into temptation in Luke chapter 22 and verse 46, uh, where Jesus says to his disciples, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Right? And so I think that... <clears throat> This prayer uh, and, and praying like this, and it's not that we necessarily have to repeat this prayer. Uh, I certainly don't think we, we should. It shouldn't be something that we just repeat for the sake of repeating. Um, but you can see how when that is your focus is, is about what's in the future, those things that lie ahead of us, then that Jesus brings that with him even to the very last day in his life where he faced so much pain and, and suffering and trials He's still able to focus on these same things that he has always prayed about, uh, right? Forgiveness is the only thing that matters. Sharing that bread and wine with his disciples uh, is, is what he wanted in that day. He, he desired with desire to share that Passover meal with them. Right? And, and he gives thanks for that bread that he can share with his disciples. Um, not leading us into temptation, right? It's so important that we, we don't get tempted to stray away from God for whatever we are tempted by in this life, right? We need to 
keep our focus on uh, on the future, on, on what lays ahead of us and that reward that is there for all of us in the future. And so <clears throat> I think this is uh, a very good focus of, of prayer is focused on uh, on, on what's coming, focus on what lies ahead of us and focus on what we need in order to get there. Whereas the, uh, the brothers and sisters that James wrote to in the Ecclesiastes was very much focused on, <clears throat> on this life. They wanted things now. They wanted their, their sufferings to be eased. They wanted the persecution to go away. They, they wanted to have uh, riches, which is what they were jealous for and envious of. And same with the people. That's what they wanted. They wanted to, to be healed. They wanted their uh, sufferings right now to be taken away. And so um, I think that is a habit that we need to get into as well. The focus on our prayers isn't so much on, on removing any suffering in this life, uh, but for us to be able to endure. That is more important because when we endure, when you hold fast to the end, um, that is when we receive our reward. It doesn't mean... Uh, that we should never ask God for ease and of our suffering. Um, we should. But we more so we have to learn to be content with our current situation and, and focus our thoughts and our energy and our prayers on the things that are to come, which is a time of, uh, of true blessing. And when that is our habit and we're sincere about that, that will become the focus of our life like it was for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to leave you uh, with this encouragement that if you are suffering, and I know that many are, if you're lonely, if you're depressed, if you're hurting, if you're sick, hold on, hold on. You are so close. Jesus stands at the door, as he said. Uh, he is very close. His return is very soon, and you can hold on. I want to encourage you to hold fast and to focus your prayers on, on what lies ahead of you, what you can uh, and, and we'll receive from God if we hold on, if we focus on what is to come, if we focus on the positive. Jesus is looking forward to sharing that meal with you. He wants to share that meal with you. And we have to focus on that too. Focus on that time that we can um, have our, our meal with Jesus and all of our suffering will finally be taken away. Consider your trials as joy, as difficult as it is, knowing that they will not last forever. Approach God in prayer. Ask him for help. Ask Jesus for help. They will help you. But let your focus be on what is to come. Have your, your mind looking forward to those things. And so let's pray in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation. Thank you.